Uh, this, I think, uh, if I re recall correctly, is the first joint um, integrated materials design center school of photovoltaics and renewable energy engineering seminar. First one we've done jointly, um, so it's great to do that. Uh, and it's quite fitting that Dirk Koenig should be the person to present that, uh, given that, as you could see from the title, um, his uh, research spans uh, nanomaterials functionality as well as photovoltaics. Um, a quick summary here before Dirk gets started. Uh, he uh, studied his uh, undergraduate and PhD at uh, Chemnitz University of Technology uh, in theory of uh, solid state and semiconductor physics. Um, uh, he then uh, worked for a year uh, with uh, AMD Europe uh, before coming in 2005 to UNSW uh, on a um, uh, on a position uh, with the ARC Photovoltaic Center of Excellence here at UNSW. He's been here since 2005, hitting the theory and characterization groups um, in the advanced concepts department of that center. Uh, he's this year been working also together with us in the IMDC, uh, given many common interests that we have, uh, and that's been helping us to build up these cross collaborations with um, with uh, photovoltaics here at UNSW. Uh, Dirk has published two uh, book chapters. Um, he uh, has 44 uh, refereed journal papers, uh, has multiple patents, uh, and has presented many invited talks and seminars at international conferences and workshops. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Dirk. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for the kind introduction. Um, OK, uh, before I actually start the talk, I like to give a quick definition of scope. Um, today I will be talking uh, about inducing electronic or NOP type behavior into ultra small silicon nanovolumes such as nanocrystals, fin fats, ULSI devices, or low power devices. It is not about doping used in other respects, like for instance, co-doping to improve luminescence properties or for plasmonics, which actually turns silicon nanodots into metal-like or uh, basically pushes them into the metal-like regime. Um, I'll start with the conventional doping the uh, the theory of it and uh, give you a broader perspective uh, before I come to experimental data from the literature, then carrying on with own results, uh, which gets a bit more precise with phosphorus in the silicon dioxide silicon nanocrystal system. And I will present three alternatives to conventional doping, as we're going to see that uh, conventional doping doesn't really cut it. Now, uh, for broad perspective, we got to look at the temperature range where we start, or where we usually dope, the silicon nanocrystals. And that happens during the segregation in the year that's from 1050 to 1200 degrees Celsius. And to see that in a thermal context, uh, we can look at uh, solid state recrystallization, which happens around 600 to 800 degrees. Uh, in microcrystalline silicon, you have there a doping range over micromans, micrometers, and also at high temperatures, you have foreign atoms diffusing on a centimeter scale that basically floats on silicon refinement. So obviously, we have a real problem here in terms of thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, the question is, what prevents the doping of silicon nanocrystals? Um, the first one is that doping requires energy because you introduce mechanical stress. And uh, so the nanocrystals develop a counter stress that's also called self-purification. And um, they also have a surface tension at the interface, which has to be overcome. Then this incorporation of, of dopants into lattice sites of silicon nanocrystals uh, competes with the full saturation of all bonds of these dopants, because that means you get dangling bonds, defects saturated. So the total binding energy of the system increases, which means it gets more stable. And even if you manage to build a donor into a lattice site of silicon nanocrystal, you still have uh, to achieve a donor ionization energy, which is on the order of the thermal energy at room temperature. And in particular, for non-crystals, which show quantum effects, so quantum confinement, as we shall see, this is uh, a basically a condition which is not uh, reached. Now, self-purification is a very uh, general phenomenon. It uh, occurs for many materials, as we can see here. Um, and the reason is that you have different at atomic sizes if you want to fit a foreign atom into a lattice. Also, we have um, 
um, stress by uh, electrostatics, so like you have an additional carrier. So the formation energy goes up and that triggers surf purification. And you can say that the formation energy in silicon nanocrystals, as you can see in these calculations, is about an order of magnitude higher as composed to bulk silicon. In bulk silicon, it's around 0.1 we, so as we know, at around 900 degrees Celsius, you can activate your dopants in a silicon lattice. On the ionization energies, um, you can treat a donor in a hydrogen atom model, um, and um, it is then a point effect, as opposed to the silicon nanocrystal, uh, when that actually goes beyond, uh, below the size of twice the Bohr radius, you start to see a widening of the energy gap, because that gives, or basically shows the quantum confinement. And until this donor actually feels quantum confinement, uh, so that hits its uh, ionization, or sorry, its highest occupied level, shifts towards uh, the vacuum energy, uh, you have to go to extremely small feature sizes. And that means that your ionization energy of your donor in that case uh, increases with shrinking nanocrystal size, as shown on the right diagram here. So for four nanometer crystals, you only have uh, an ionization probability of 10 to the minus three as opposed to bulk silicon. And uh, more precise uh, density functional calculations of 1.5 nanometer crystals uh, show us that we have a doping probability on the order of eight uh, orders of magnitude below the bulk value, which is also not 100%, but obviously it's enough to make devices work very well. I'd like to come now to experimental data. Um, I start with freestanding nanocrystals. Um, there's been pioneering work done by uh, Vigas and um, Pereira of the Stutzmann Group at the Walter Schottke Institute in Munich. And they measure the connectivity as uh, a function of doping density. And what we see here is uh, at room temperature, we have an increase of the connectivity by a factor of three when you go from undoped samples to nearly degenerate doped samples. So that's about the conduction by density of states of bulk silicon. So every four nanometers, you would have a donor, and that's for 30 nanometer crystals. So that means basically that doping fails because, I mean, in, in uh, bulk silicon, you would have an extremely high connectivity. But for silicon ion crystals, this doesn't appear to apply yet if you increase the doping by one more order of magnitude, so I go to 1.5 times 10 to the 20th per cubic centimeter, you almost lose your temperature dependence of connectivity completely. So it's just an order of magnitude when you go from 10 Kelvin to room temperature. And that is a clear indication that you have a semiconductor to semi-metal transition, and that was already found out by Pearson and Bardin in uh, 1949. So that transition occurs around 0.3 atom percent of dopants with the corresponding density shown here. And from solar cells, we all know that from aluminum silicate, which gives a very good back surface field contact, and that's one percent, atom percent aluminum in silicon. So it's actually not new to us. Now, uh, Rui Pereira has done very pioneering work with electron paramagnetic resonance to uh, trace phosphorus atoms with an unpaired electron. And uh, He's shown, as you can see in that graph, that the efficiency of phosphorus atoms to potentially give away an electron uh, goes down from around 10 to the minus 2, that's 1%, to a few times 10 to the minus 5 for silicon nanocrystals where we see quantum confinement. Now, this already shows the problem we have that the basically the, if you have a phosphorus atom with an unpaired electron, and uh, you measure that by electron paramagnetic resonance, this is still no conclusive ev evidence actually that you can ionize it because the electron in EPR undergoes a spin flip, so you can measure that resonance as a function of the magnetic field with a microwave detector. And uh, that can only occur or can be measured at very low temperatures because uh, otherwise you run into trouble with uh, thermal noise. So more problems actually occur in ultra large scale integration. Um, as shown here on the left hand side, we see um, dopant inactivation by clustering and also under diffusion from the source and drain regions, which are degenerately doped underneath the crystal. And even if you use a flash anneal, um, which was started to be developed at the 65 nanometer technology node, 
uh, you have an outdiffusion of 5 nanometers. And meanwhile, with 14 nanometer gate length, that's very detrimental to devices. And this is a very hard entropy wall, so we kind of hit a hard limit here. And we really got to think about how can we introduce NP-type behavior into ultra small silicon volumes, be it nanocrystals or fin fats or flash prompts. That's um, uh, a real pressing question. Now, uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to have a few words on issues in the literature with sample preparation. There are mainly two. The first one is excess silicon. Um, most, or as I show, quite a few uh, literature sources use too much excess silicon. So that actually forms, as you can see here in a, in a applied physics letters paper, forms an amorphous silicon silicon nanocrystal network. So you got actually a continuous silicon path from the rear electrode to the gate electrode. And we see that very nicely here with an energy filtered uh, transmission electron microscopic uh, image where you see all the silicon, not just the crystallites, which happen to have the right plane orientation to be seen in TEM. But those are actually shown by these white circles. So if you just use TEM, you see these three crystallites. But if you use energy filter TEM, or you can use energy electron loss spectroscopy, you see all the silicon in the sample, which is obviously a lot more. Now, that material uh, would actually respond to doping much better, because obviously you got a lot of amorphous silicon, which kind of integrates the, uh, the dopants. But you will have a low carrier mobility, because it's grossly amorphous. But also, your lifetime will be sh very short, because you have a lot of defects in the Ubach tails, so your Shockley reed hardware combination is tricky, in particular with a uh, low carrier mobility. Now, in the past, um, there were several ways to um, provide experimental evidence of, of successful doping. Um, apart from increased connectivity uh, of doped samples versus non doped samples, I'll come to that a bit later, uh, there was also uh, capacitance voltage measurements uh, being presented. Now, if we do a CV or capacitance, capacitance voltage measurement, uh, we probe the space charge region as a function of band bending, and that requires a continuous silicon path from a rear electrode to your MIS structure, that means to the gate oxide or gate insulator. So if you can measure a CV curve, you have not separate nanocrystals, you have a continuous network. And um, what we see here, actually, the, the right-hand graph is quite instructive because you can see that even the geometrical capacitance breaks in as you go for higher frequencies, which is very unusual for crystalline silicon, because majorities can follow the small AC signal field uh, up to a megahertz. And so that's actually a clear indication of low mobility, or in other words, amorphous silicon. And uh, we've seen on the last slide that the formation of a silicon non-crystal amorphous silicon network starts around SIO, that means silicon monoxide. And there are several uh, yeah, papers, a more recent one, I think, that one's a bit, a bit uh, older, the first one. Um, they use concentrations which are in that range, basically, that you build a network. And then you get CV curves, obviously. Also, uh, a solar cell has been reported, a nanocrystal superlattice solar cell, um, which is a, a, very leap a very good leap forward. It's a striking result, but we should not fool ourselves that these are separate silicon nanocrystals. It's not going to help, because it's not. And uh, that's very important, actually, to advance research further, to describe the material property uh, in a good way. The other issue in the literature is that uh, excess dopant densities are used, again, for electronic doping, not for, for uh, optical properties or plasmonics. And the range of uh, concentrations goes from 1 atom percent up to 12. Um, and the question, I mean, mostly it's actually probed by photoluminescence and atom probe tomography is shown to localize the dopants. And uh, I think we got to ask ourselves what photoluminescence data actually describe, because they are not element specific. And as a result of that, we got to ask ourselves, how do we obtain a clear evidence for active dopants? That led, uh, or leads me to the characterization strategy for active dopants. And there are four points, uh, quite important. The first one is we need a characterization technique which can detect element-specific signals. Then 
this technique must be able to detect the oxidation state of, in that case, the donor, so whether it's neutral or positively ionized, that means it gives away its electron as we want it to. Um, then we also need the technique to be sensitive enough to go below 0.3 atom percent to detect the donors. And last but not least, uh, it must be non-destructive because if you, if you use any sputtering or whatever technique, you uh, will change the material. Now from the four uh, spectroscopic methods uh, I listed here, we see that the first, or that basic photoluminescence already drops out at the first criterion. So the presence of the, all we know is that the presence of the doping causes the signal, but we don't know what it actually is, whether it, it shifts a defect or whether it actually has a dopant specific signal, but it's not really an ionized signal, it's just a defect signal, etc. Now when we go to the oxidation state, um, the only way actually to, to detect that is by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or uh, as we shall see, this shall see later, uh, Xanus, so X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy. Um, regarding sensitivity, uh, we run into problems with XPS because uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's really getting kind of tricky if you go below 0.5 atom percent. And below 0.1 atom percent with XPS, uh, you have virtually no chance. Uh, maybe at a synchrotron where you have very high beam brilliance, but uh, usually that's not the case. Now, uh, XPS runs into uh, more problems when it comes to leaving the sample intact because it's very surface sensitive, so usually we got to sputter into our sample to do in-depth probing of silicon ion crystals, in particular for silicon because they need capping for preventing uh, air oxidation. And that causes uh, atomic rearrangement. You got different sputter rates depending on the chemical element, so we don't really see what was originally there. If we sum that all up, uh, we see that Xane is, actu is actually the most suited technique uh, we can use. Um, Xane is alone, though, of course, is not enough. You need a very high resolution spatial technique to see where your dopants are. So the combination of both, actually, is required. I'd like to come now to own results on phosphorus in the silicon dioxide silicon ion crystal system. Um, we start with hybrid DFT calculations. Um, here with uh, silicon dioxide, um, we see the phosphorus atom here, that's a, an orange, shown orange, and the four next neighbor oxygen atoms are shown in cyan. And uh, oxygen is red, silicon is gray, and the hydrogen of the hydroxide groups is white. We calculated two approximants, one is actually with phosphorus and the other one is pure. And we see the density of states here, like the, the faint one is the reference. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that we get two deep levels introduced by phosphorus, but you can see that the occupied level is down here, that there's no way you can, op uh, you can ionize that over the energy gap. But what I also put in here is a highest occupied state and lowest unoccupied state of a one and a half nanometer quantum dot completely terminated with hydroxide groups to actually gauge where these defects are. And what's quite striking is that these two defects introduced by phosphorus tremendously decrease the tunneling hopping barrier of silicon dioxide. And that causes, because that goes exp exponentially into hopping and, and uh, tunneling conduction, that tremendously increases the conductivity. And uh, this clearly shows that increasing conductivity is not evidence for doping. Any defect could do that. And it's not even, it's not even any, any ionized level here. So uh, next we calculated silicon monoxide, or SiO 0.9, where the situation is uh, similar, you cut down on the barriers as well, but in addition you have a deep level which uh, yeah, is prone to trigger recombination. Silicon monoxide is usually a one to two mole layer shell around a silicon nanocrystal crystal because you don't have a sharp transition from silicon to silicon dioxide. Next we looked at uh, the one and a half nanocrystal, uh, nan one and a half nanometer nanocrystals mentioned. Um, and there we exchanged, see the reference here, we exchanged a corner atom, so SI atom with two hydroxide groups by phosphorus with two hydroxide, uh, three hydroxide groups. Then we took off one hydroxide group of the silicon corner atom and replaced this by uh, POH4. And as another version, we just took off the hydrogen atom 
from the corner heart exile group and again put POH4 on it. And the good news is actually you see there is no defect introduced in the gap, which is in accord with uh, theory. So as long as you don't go to excessive phosphorus concentration, your PS signal intensity actually goes up. And the reason for that is that you have gathering introduced by phosphorus. Because again, as I said earlier, in terms of, of thermodynamic thermodynamics, it's uh, more stable if you have gathered bonds from the silicon, seen from the silicon as well as from the dopant atom. Now comes the most interesting part, which is uh, looking at phosphorus within silicon nanocrystals. And at first we put uh, phosphorus in the central position on a silicon lattice site. And please note that this situation is extremely rare because you got a very high formation energy. So while we have phosphorus within the nanocrystals, as I show, shall show later, um, it's, it's extremely rare that it's on the lattice side. What we get for one and a half nanometer crystal is we actually have a donor orbital, so that's, that's good news. However, the ionization energy is very large. That means at room temperature there's no way we can ionize that. That in return means even if the phosphorus is on the lattice side, it will not give away its electron. And um, of course, the ionization energy will go down with increasing nanocrystal size because quantum confinement subsides. But as we shall see in experiment, it's still not enough up to five nanometers. It's not going to get ionized. The other option we got, uh, which is actually accounting for virtually 100% of all phosphorus within the nanocrystals, is on a having phosphorus on an interstitial side. Um, they get two relatively shallow levels, but again, the highest occupied state due to phosphorus can't be ionized. It's more than two electron volts. Um, what's interesting here is actually that we got a spin flip between the two defect levels introduced by phosphorus, and that should uh, be visible in PL, around 720 nanometers. This wavelength will go up. That means the transition energy will go down with increasing nanocrystal size. So if you have nanocrystals on the order of 4 nanometer and they emit at 1.2 eV, you actually may get a signal at 1 eV. Actually, I think it has been shown by Fuji at all a few years ago. Now, if we do all these calculations, we also got to make sure that we know, or roughly at least know, where the phosphorus atoms are. And that's actually where it gets a bit complex, because you've got so many nanocrystals, you've got to work with statistics. There is no, no individual tracing as we do in DFT. Um, what we see here on the lower left-hand side is a proxygram, which integrates over the normal vector of the interface. And it shows the oxygen, silicon, silicon oxygen, and phosphorus concentration. And we see that the maximum is actually at the interface. So that supports the gathering uh, hypothesis we have for thermo uh, from thermodynamics. But also we see there's quite a bit of phosphorus within the nanocrystal. And that is on interstitial sites. Now the decisive part regarding the ionization was the X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy measurements. And what we do there is we excite a K-shell uh, level, which we can trace element specific in that case of phosphorus, and we wait for electrons to drop back into that level and they send off an X-ray photon with a characteristic energy, element specific characteristic energy. And that backdrop onto the K-shell level depends on the, on the ionization of the specific atom. So if the atom is positively ionized, this binding energy or basically the energy difference will increase because you get, you get a base in orbital contraction because you don't have charge neutrality. Because we used an all electron molecular orbital basis sets in DFT, we could also use these data uh, quasi as a spin-off to interpret the Xana spectra, which was very, very useful. Now, for phosphorus doped silicon wafers well below the alloy level, um, we get a ionization energy of the K-shell of phosphorus of almost 2,145 electron volts. Then we had samples uh, where we had silicon dioxide doped with phosphorus, and we can see that there's actually two peaks. One coincides nicely with phosphorus and silicon dioxide, the K-shell level. The other one is a is few electron volts off, and what I did then is actually I calculated the phosphorus pentoxide to see whether actually that fits. And interestingly, 
it fits quite well. So that actually raises the question whether we have a phase separation in the oxide. So actually that the phosphorus doesn't even get built into the silicon dioxide, but that the phosphorus forms dephosphorus pentoxide, which is again supported by the oxidation enthalpy, because it's way higher for phosphorus as opposed to silicon. Um, the nanocrystal samples all, regardless of size, so from five to, uh, sorry, two to five nanometers, and even for the uh, silicon rich oxide bark sample, which has a uh, few bigger crystals, they all show lower binding energies of the K shell. And this is a clear evidence that the phosphorus is less positively charged, significantly less positively charged as uh, opposed to phosphorus in bark silicon. And that in return means that this phosphorus does not give away an electron. And this in return means at room temperature, because we can measure at room temperature with xanus, uh, phosphorus does not provide electrons as a donor in nanocrystals up to five nanometer size. I'll come to the alternatives now. We have to conventional purity doping. And I'll start uh, with the interface impact of the dielectric. What we did here was uh, we used, again, uh, hybrid density functional theory modeling uh, for fully functional group terminated silicon nanocrystals um, to diff basically various sizes up to three nanometers. And uh, specifically, I'd like to uh, yeah, uh, draw your attention to amino and hydroxyl terminated uh, nanocrystals, which account for nitrite and oxide embedding. And um, what we see there is uh, that we have a shift of a gap of around 0.6 EV to higher values when we go from oxide to nitride termination. And this is very interesting because that has already been shown in experiment way back. But there was no explanation. More interestingly, for introducing NP-type behavior, we see that the highest occupied state is shifted by one half electron volt and the lowest unoccupied state even by 2.1 EV accounting for the opening of the band gap, uh, when we go from uh, oxide to nitride. And uh, this is fairly independent of size, as we can see. And it is a function of the electron affinity, electronegativity, and the ionization energy of the respective anion we use, in that case, oxygen and nitrogen, relative to silicon. Um, we've also shown that this functional group termination emulates the dielectric very well and that the electronic structure for strong anions like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine is dominated for silicon nanocrystals um, up to sizes of at least four nanometers. Um, as I'll show in, in, uh, in a few slides, it's actually gone almost to the double of that value. Now, how do we know that uh, nitrogen versus oxygen makes a difference in the experiment. We used a, or we used samples, so silicon nanocrystal super lattices of four and two nanometer thickness, and annealed these in argon versus nitrogen. So if you anneal them in argon, there's, there's no atomic species being built into the structure. If we use nitrogen, uh, we get some nitrogen built at the, or built in at the interface from the silicon nanocrystal, the silicon dioxide. How do we know that? Uh, First, we track nitrogen within the sample with elastic recoil detection. Um, and we get around one atom percent within the sample. Then we use XPS to measure the binding energy. And we see that in our samples, uh, it's actually shifted 0 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 EV to higher binding energies as opposed to nitrogen and silicon nitride. And that's very interesting, because what's going to happen is if you got silicon nitride, you got the nitrogen atom, first next neighbor, silicon. Second next neighbor is nitrogen. Third next neighbor, silicon, nitrogen, etc. So you have a certain ionization of your nitrogen, from the, mainly from the first next neighbor, silicon atoms. In our samples, you have nitrogen, first next neighbor, silicon, second next neighbor, oxygen. Silicon, oxygen, silicon, oxygen. So these oxygen atoms already ionize or take away more electrons from the first next neighbor, silicon atoms, of the nitrogen atom. So the nitrogen atom in return cannot get as negatively ionized as it gets in silicon nitride. And that brings that shift. It's not a full oxidation number. Then uh, we also used uh, SIMS and high angle angular dark field scanning tunneling electron microscopy, which scans, or was actually set to scan the, 
the silicon signal. And what we see here is actually that the SIN signal is in phase with the silicon signal. And if you think in SIMS, when you go through your sample, you actually get wider and wider circumferences until you hit the central position of the silicon nanocrystals. So if your signal is in phase, you're actually kind of scanning the interface. If, it, if your nitrogen is actually dispersed throughout the dielectric, it works the other way around. It's an antiphase because if your, your crystallites get smaller towards, or have a lower diameter towards the edges of your, your non-crystal layer, then the volume of the, of the oxide expands. So if the nitrogen is in the oxide, you get a signal in antiphase. That the signal is in phase actually tells us it's at the interface of the dot. Then we also measured photoluminescence, and obviously the band gap goes up with shrinking non-crystal size. That's, that's well known. What we also saw is that we have an increasing difference of silicon nanocrystal uh, band gaps when we go from argon in yield samples to nitrogen in yield samples. So the smaller the dots get, the bigger the difference is, which in, again points towards interface phenomenon because the, your, your interface or surface to volume ratio increases as the nanocrystal size shrinks. Now I've shown that we measured around one atom percent of nitrogen at the interface and or, yeah, the question then is what does it mean in, in, in terms of interface coverage? To find out about that, we did a calculation of a silicon 10 nanocrystal. That's actually the smallest silicon cage assembly which behaves as a nanocrystal. So it does, it's not like completely discrete in its density of states. And we covered that with three monolayers of silicon dioxide. So that's our reference shown here in dotted lines. And then we exchanged the oxygen at the interface by quarter of a monolayer. So we removed four out of 16 oxygen atoms and replaced these by, uh, by nitrogen atoms. And we also used the data of the uh, 1.9 nanometer non-crystal. It's completely hard, uh, terminated by hydroxyl and amino groups. And we had an estimate uh, of the interface coverage with nitrogen of 0.1 uh, to 0.2 monolayers. And uh, this assumes that the band gap, or change in band gap, or sorry, change in energy gap of the nanocrystals is linear with, uh, depending on the anion coverage. Turns out that it's not, uh, as you can see here. So we have a complete uh, hydroxide coverage and gradually remove the oxygen coverage and go to amino or nitrogen coverage until we have full amino coverage. And we see while the high occupied state and the lowest occupied state, unoccupied state, go up towards the vacuum level, the gap actually is kind of yeah, bouncing about a bit. So that actually opens up the range. And we still have the main value around 0.2 monolayers, but it's not as, as narrow as we originally thought. So we've seen that we have an interface charge transfer. The question is, how can we describe that now? And what's the impact? The description is fairly straightforward in geometrical arguments. So we have a certain impact length of the interface charge transfer in bulk. If you go to a quantum well or very thin layer, you have two adjacent interfaces, so we kind of double the distance. When you go to a nano wire, you can basically cut out a cylindrical element, which takes the part which is non-periodic. And there you can turn these cubicles into wedges. So you have actually uh, smallest volume elements. And if, if you integrate over these, you get the total volume. And a wedge is twice as long if you keep the same volume as opposed to a cubicle. Um, so again, you increase uh, the impact length of the interface charge transfer. And then when you go to a quantum dot, you do the same again. You take the wedge and cut it to a pyramid. So we come up with a ratio of the impact length shown here. Now. An experiment has been shown that you get different energy gaps for silicon nanocrystals of same size, depending whether they are embedded in oxide or nitride. And that goes up to about 7 nanometers. So this gives us an estimate for the interface charge transfer impact length for quantum dots. So that means up to a diameter of 7 nanometers, the electronic structure is actually dominated by the dielectric, not by the size, which is um, quite indicative because if we look at absorption and PL energies, um, it's, it's extremely difficult to get any reliable signal above two electron volts. Now, 
This also has been confirmed by silicon nanocrystal ionization, as we can see here from DFT. Um, we also have here the ratio of uh, silicon core atoms uh, to interface groups. That's actually the, the uh, purple curve down here. And you can see actually that for strong anions, fluorine actually is, is rather easy to calculate here. So we are up to three nanometers now. Uh, that we get a huge charge transfer there. It's 81 electrons. So this is way more than you have in a Coulomb blockade, for instance, with a small nanocrystal. And that means this nanoscopic field effect is very robust. And every own crystal or every single crystal has its own nanoscopic field effect. Um, we also need a very small amount of dielectric coverage. So two or three monolayers will do it. And um, you can also see that it's a, a surface or interface related effect by the quadratic curvature. And the fact that we don't see a turning point shows that even for three nanometers, we are still very far off the saturation limit. Now, what can we do with these results, you know, like getting basically an energy offset as a function of the dielectric? Um, it's a very fundamental effect. And you can do a lot of different uh, yeah, devices, structures with it. Uh, I'd just like to focus on the right-hand side of the slide here. Um, if you use silicon nitride, silicon oxide, and silicon, we have CMOS, silicon CMOS compatible materials um, in a CMOS compatible structure. Um, and what we can do then is actually we can have a band offset as a function of dielectric coverage. So what we see here is uh, silicon oxide coverage near uh, drain source and a silicon nitride dielectric for the gate. And that gives us the band structure shown here. So we have a fully depleted n-type self-blocking uh, misfit. And to get a p-type self-blocking misfit, we just have to swap the dielectric. So we take, we take oxide here, nitrate there, and we, we inverse the band diagram. And that's very, very nice, because you can build two transistor inverters with that same technology, same material to just swap them. And no doping, obviously. So the second alternative I'd like to talk about is uh, modulation doping. Um, where we use the excess silicon or germanium we have anyway to form silicon nanocrystals as a doping source. And modulation doping is known from 3.5s and it's been around for quite some time. Uh, that was actually uh, um, Dingle and Sturmer in 1978 who came up with the idea. And uh, I mean, any, any laser pointers work with it because you need possibly a scatter free transport. Um, and we can do the same actually, say we got, we got uh, silicon in the barrier material, so that actually acts as a donor and provides an electron to a silicon nanocrystal. Question is what that barrier layer could be. So there are a number of advantages if we do that. The first one is we don't use an additional doping species, so there are no defects introduced by yet another chemical element in the sample, because silicon or germanium is there anyway to segregate. Then the amount we need for doping is minute as compared to nanocrystal formation. So that means actually nanocrystal formation should not be influenced at all. And also, very important point here, doping a matrix is way easier than doping a nanocrystal because you got less restrictions. Because quasi-continuous, and actually the fact that you see the amorphous crystalline nanocrystalline networks being doped, silicon networks being doped, shows that that's the case. Only we have an inverse structure here where we have separate nanocrystals and we dope the barrier. The question then is uh, what material can we use? We need desired band offsets, so type 1 quantum confinement uh, to keep quantum properties. And we also must make sure that we don't run into an autocompensation um, regime with 3.5s. And that means we need, uh, or silicon is actually amorphous, uh, sorry, amphoteric for three or five compounds because it's a main group four element. So what we got to do is because we want to use it as a donor on a cation site, we got to make the anion possibly anionic. And that means we go for group three nitrites. So we don't have auto compensation as a major problem. And if you look at the band offsets, um, the two nitrite compounds we can use is aluminum nitrite and gallium nitrite, and obviously then also the ternary. Then again, uh, we did uh, density functional theory calculations. Uh, first, in order to see whether our calculations are correct, we introduced silicon into aluminum nitride. 
and calculated the ionization energy of the donors, and that was 0.11, 0.17 eV, which is fairly near the experiment, so calculations are fairly accurate. Question then is, um, we look at germanium, because germanium would be, in, in silicon nitride, would be another option uh, to diversify the material systems we work in and give us a better angle on desired properties. Um, so we did the calculations and we saw actually a, a bigger uh, splitting due to germanium being a heavy atom, but also uh, higher ionization energy. And as there are no experimental values for aluminium nitride, the probable, re probable reason is that germanium is, is way worse than silicon, so there's no, there's no interest really to work that way. Now with the ionization energies uh, calculated, they are depicted here, uh, we can use a formula uh, published by the Valukovic group, which uh, describes the band gap when you go from pure aluminum nitride to pure gallium nitride. And we can use that formula to calculate the band offsets. And uh, that shows us where we actually stand in terms of ionization energy and relaxation energy of these donor electrons into silicon quantum structures. So if you see that here, that's uh, the energy we could use is on the order of uh, half an electron volt for gallium nitride up to one half electron volt for aluminum nitride. Technology-wise, uh, we can do an in-situ doping by having these aluminum gallium nitride barriers and silicon or germanium rich nitride. And we do a segregation anneal anyway to form silicon nanocrystals and the doping would happen in situ. That means there's not even an additional processing step. If the process design works out, because obviously these are two different processes and uh, yeah, we both have to fit into one uh, process parameter scheme. The last alternative I'd like to talk about is modulation doped silicon dioxide. Um, these are preliminary results here. Um, and uh, we start again with hybrid density functional theory. And the idea behind doping or modulation doping silicon dioxide is that silicon dioxide is simply the best material to passivate silicon in terms of chemical surface passivation, but also it's very, very, it's a very good material for phase separation. If you've got silicon rich oxide, you have a much better phase separation as opposed to silicon rich nitride or carbide. So it only appears to be logical to look into modulation doping of silicon nanocrystals, like this one actually showing uh, quantum behavior, with the chemical potential, or also uh, bulk systems. As you shall see, this is uh, quite interesting as well. Now, we again did a hybrid density functional calculation on a silicon 10 nanocrystal we've seen earlier in three monolayer silicon dioxide, but this time using different mo molecular orbital basis sets and pseudopotentials. Again, the reference is pure and the uh, doped sample has an acceptor complex at the very outer location we can have in the three moon layers surrounding the silicon 10 nanocrystal. And what I'd like to show you here is actually a detail of the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied state, um, which only exists in uh, the doped silicon dioxide. You can actually see the reference curve here, uh, the faint one, for the, uh, for the pure silicon dioxide with the nanocrystal. Now, if we have an isodensity plot of these two orbitals, we see actually that they are located at the silicon nanocrystal, shown in Cyan here, as well as at the acceptor complex. And that goes through three monolayers of pure silicon dioxide, or almost a nanometer. And so that, that is actually a very long distance in DFT. And it's also a significant density, as you can see, because uh, it's not uh, it it's has a considerable spatial extension. And that means actually that with the seven Armstrong quantum dot, we just hit the energy limit that we can attract an electron from the silicon nanocrystal to the acceptor complex and thereby provide a hole to the nanocrystal. And that in return means for all bigger crystals where quantum confinement subsides, this energy difference is increasing. That means the electron has more and more energy to gain when it goes from the nanocrystal into this acceptor complex which means it works over longer distances and with higher probabilities. Um, I'll show experimental results now, uh, which are kind of uh, preliminary. 
Um, the general structure we use so far for uh, doping characterization is shown here. So you mostly have n-type silicon wafers, rapid thermal oxide. We accept the complex in monolayers and a capping oxide with a gate. With the C or high frequency CV measurements, uh, we see a shift of the flap and voltage due to a fixed negative charge, which in return is due to um, the negatively ionized acceptor complex. Um, we also used deep level transient spectroscopy, which is a very viable technique um, to clarify the energetics and kinetics of defects such as uh, modulation acceptors in uh, silicon dioxide. And we have, we applied two schemes. Uh, the first one we used here was uh, to pulse, at, at very low temperature, to pulse the samples into deep depletion, uh, sorry, into, f into flat band, so actually fill the acceptor states, and then you go back to deep depletion, so you lift up your band structure, and then you watch or record the transient, how the electrons tunnel back out. We do that at very low temperature to get maximum energy resolution, so we don't have hopping or thermal broadening. And what we found out is that this energy distance is around 0.6 EV from below the valence band edge of silicon. And we can even use a 1D Poisson solver to come up with the distance these peaks, two peaks have when we decompose the signal. And it turns out that the movement of the, of the uh, acceptor complex is extremely small. It's about plus minus two angstrom. So it's a monolayer. And that in return means we can make extremely thin layers like 10 angstrom if you want to. It's probably a bigger problem to make the layer than to dope it, um, which again is very, very good for transport. Now we use another scheme with DLTS at high temperatures to account for the maximum density of ionized acceptors. And there we used scheme A, which means we keep the sample of flap and voltage and then we quickly pulse into P inversion. At that temperature, like 500 Kelvin, you won't have depletion or any anymore by inversion. Um, and then we go back to flap and voltage and we look all the electrons going back into these acceptor states. And by using, uh, choosing high temperature, we activate all transport paths, so tunneling, thermal hopping, uh, trap assisted tunneling. So basically we open all the gates that a maximum density of carriers can go back. And that correlates very nicely with the number of uh, monolayers of uh, modulation acceptors. And you can also see in terms of kinetics with the pulse time, which discharges uh, the modulation acceptor complexes uh, that you have, because that's proportional actually to the position or depth within the oxide, that you have uh, a clear difference. Now what can we use these uh, modulation acceptors for? Um, obviously it's, again, it's CMOS compatible and for you LSI it's very interesting because you can again introduce p-type behavior in silicon nanovolumes but without size limit because the oxide nitrate coverage has a size limit. Um, otherwise, probably would have been discovered earlier. Um, but for this doping principle, there is no size limit, as we know from 3 fives uh, with modulation doping. As we mostly work on solar cells here, um, I think a very important aspect or interesting aspect for hit solar cells is that you can introduce carrier selective contacts with uh, fixed charges. In that case, actually, a uh, whole selective contact with a fixed negative charge. And again, as I said earlier, because we can make these doped oxide layers extremely thin, the connectivity will be very high. What I specifically want to look at now is a really preliminary result uh, on lifetime measurements with this coating. And we see that here, and it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of funny, really, because this is just an out-of-the-woods ordinary wafer. It's, it's, it's a thick micromechanics wafer. It's double-side polished for FTIR. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. It wasn't passivated. We just put an RTO on it, doped it, and put a capping oxide on it. That's it. And then we did a lifetime testing um, over the entire wafer. What you see here is an average. It's not like a specific point, it's an average. And we saw that we get uh, two milliseconds, as you can see here, two milliseconds uh, carrier lifetime at a carrier density corresponding to around 0.1 suns. If you go to one sun, it's still one millisecond. And that wasn't even optimized for any passivation purpose, let alone it was passivated with, with hydrogen. So I think that's quite encouraging, and there's quite a bit we can do with it. Um, I'd like to come to the conclusions now. I think I've shown that 
we hit a size limit in conventional silicon nanovolume doping, which is uh, a really hard entropy wall. Um, so we got to think about different uh, ways to introduce NP-type behavior into such small silicon nanovolumes. More specifically, I've shown my own results that embedded or doping of embedded nanocrystals in silicon dioxide with phosphorus fails. Um, in that context, actually, if you look at the literature, we should keep in mind that there is a um, alloy limit for doping. That means if you put in too much foreign atoms, you actually do not have silicon anymore. You got a semi-metal or basically a ternary oxide, depending on how much of what element you put in there. And also that if you have too much excess silicon, you get very nice materials, um, like, like actually the APL in 2009 has shown that you get uh, a nice thin film solar cell. But we fool ourselves if we think that these are separate nanocrystals. It's no help, because this material behaves very different. Um, as first alternative, I've shown that there's uh, an interface charge transfer depending on the uh, embedding dielectric. Embedding here means actually uh, two to three monolayers that effect will then actually saturate. And this effect is, uh, um, or enables us actually to do CMOS compatible undoped uh, misfits, which again are CMOS compatible in terms of logic. So I got NP channel transistors. I can use for on-chip photo detectors, ultra low power uh, devices as well, because you don't, don't have doping scattering heat dissipation. So these are very interesting properties for ULSI. The second alternative I've shown is that we use the excess silicon or germanium concentration we have in the samples anyway to dope an adjacent barrier layer, namely aluminum gallium nitride. Unfortunately, that only works for nitride, not for oxide, again, because of uh, oxidation enthalpy. So if you use silicon-rich oxide, you would decompose aluminum gallium nitride because aluminum has a way higher, way higher oxidation enthalpy as opposed to silicon. So that only works for nitride. And the third alternative I've shown was uh, silicon dioxide. And I didn't show that, but we're currently working on it. And it looks, looks fairly promising silicon nitride modulation doping of ultra small silicon nano volumes. And that again is CMOS compatible without a size limit. So you can, for instance, dope an oxide trench of a MOSFET. Um, and also we can make highly, car highly carrier selective and passivated contacts for heat solar cells. Um, of course, I haven't done all this work on my own. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the engineering faculty here for providing massive compute power, as well as especially the IMDC, um, both at UNSW, and then a number of scientists I've been working with over the years, in particular Daniel Hiller, for uh, excellent sample preparation and PL measurements. Yeah, so I'm, I'm finished with my talk. Uh, if there are any questions, we still got five minutes, I think, yeah, so. Questions? Yeah, thank you very much for putting everything into perspective. And I mm -hmm. think it's very important what you said, that is that we need to make a clear difference between material with isolated nanocrystals and material that actually probably has a network in mm. within it, and that's, I think, very important. But one thing that I don't know then is, since you're focusing on the nanocrystals and they are isolated, mm. once they become part, if, if we were going to use them in a, in a super lattice, for example, then mm. they are not any more isolated nanocrystals. So therefore, they do become part of a network. So all these calculations, mm. although relevant for the nanocrystal, I don't see how they would be relevant for the super lattice, precisely when you have the super lattice. All, all sorts of other things happen in terms of the allowed uh, energy states and where the defects would go and so on. Yeah, got mini malformations. So yeah. Yeah. And so um, is there then a connection then between what we can calculate and mm -hmm. prove for isolated nanocrystals that you could then uh, easily extrapolate to a material where you would have an actual um, super lattice with the, with the nanocrystals? Well, first, these results we see here are for super lattices. They are not for isolated nanocrystals. I mean, these super lattices have two nanometer barriers and have sizes then two, three, four, five nanometers. 
only the silicon axis uh, concentration is small enough that you don't get this interconnected network. And uh, there's a very interesting paper by Sebastian Gucci. I think it's goes back a bit, uh, who did uh, uh, a lot of electronic characterization. I think it's here, yeah. Yeah, that one here. And uh, it's quite interesting what, what's happening there with transport. And you, you do see a connection between the nanocrystals, but it's, it's way different. The conductivity is way less. And there is a gray zone, obviously. But if you have such a network, it's strictly speaking not a silicon nanocrystal superlattice anymore, because you have amorphous interconnections between these nanocrystals. So whether you still can talk about a superlattice, uh, I don't know, because a super lattice is based on, as, as the name suggests, on a very periodic superstructure arrangement. So you actually get these mini bands, you know, and you, you get the constant offsets. So you actually see, electronically, see super lattice properties, which is actually fine if, if you use molecular beam epitaxy in three fives. And, and uh, that's one of the major problems we have, actually, with segregation in yields, because you don't have this, this structural information, you know, which you can imprint on the entire structure. So. Doing calculations with that is probably futile and so far as you would have to do a lot of statistics. And these calculations take up to six months per approximate. So this the basically the computation effort becomes prohibitive, yeah, unfortunately. But then I go back to, as you pointed out, Sebastian actually did mm. use what would have been a super what what, what is a super lattice, but they are still pretty much disconnected because as you pointed out, mm. the transport is terrible. Not terrible. It, the, the transport is so low that it clearly indicates that that the uh, the, the the main transport mechanism would have been hopping. Yeah. Right. Or and so actually, actually, fat versus atomic. Or yeah. Um, so Back once again, even if we were to be able to dope the nanocrystal, it still wouldn't necessarily do anything for us if they are still isolated. If we're thinking about this as Not using it as a material for a bulk? Not for solar cells, but if you have flash problems, for instance, you want to store charges, actually, it's, it's quite useful. So, I, I so, agree so, then, so, that so if you're thinking of other, other, other... I think the point is that, that it's... It's a gray zone. It's very difficult, actually, to... I mean, either you put in so much silicon that you lose the control of electronic properties, like the effective band gap, for instance, or the effective nanocrystal gap. Which, for instance, with the solar cell here, the band gap's 1.8 eV. If you look at hydrogen passivated amorphous silicon, I mean, it depends on how you define the band gap, but it's 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 not it's not a lot different. Now, if you want to control it further, you really need separate nanocrystals, but then you lose your con your your transport properties, and and it's. I'm afraid there is no strong overlap, which would achieve both. So, but that's that's just. The real situation, I guess. So, yeah. Hi, Dick. Thanks for a good talk. Mm. Um, you showed this modulation doping result. Mm. Which one? The well, close to the end. Yeah. Where you have the electron clouds. As density, the MO as density plot. Yeah, that one. Mm. Sure. So, if we're, what's the Atom in the matrix right now? Um, it's sorry. Are we, okay, okay, yeah. okay. If you have another one of those atoms at the interface, mm -hmm. do you have a feeling for what that would do to, to the result? So basically, if you relocate that, do you mean we relocate that? Uh, Two atoms in total. Ah, okay. Um, no, we didn't check on that yet, but we have experimental results which show it works. And because we look into nitrides now, which com again requires a lot of compute powers, and also we look for uh, look for donors in, in oxides as well, we kind of focus on that one because that's actually kind of a pathfinder. Because once we, we see good results, we use it as a shortcut in experiment, you know, in, ex in sample preparation. If the temp sample preparation turns out to show really good results, as it did here, then it's not like I would say we lose interest, but we we basically focus on another material system. To try to get more options, you know, and, and so yeah, but that, that's that's a very interesting question, and I think you would not usually if you have a system where the electrons or 
yeah, in that case, electrons get removed from the, from the dot. Um, but it may have exchange interaction between these uh, different uh, doping complexes, but because you embed them in the very wide band gap material, uh, exchange interaction is very localized. So unless you have two really neighboring, say in that case, acceptor complexes, uh, you will not uh, see a tremendous change in the electronic structure. And that in return makes it kind of robust an experiment. Mm. Yeah. All right. So thanks again, Dirk, and uh, mm. thanks everybody.